in seven people in developing countries fights malnutrition. One in four people in sub-Saharan Africa grapples with it. It kills more than three million children a year. And when you see the bodies of children racked by malnutrition, your heart breaks and your mind reels and you think, we've got to feed these kids today. And then you realize, no, not just today. We've got to make sure that there's food in perpetuity. And then you might get a, uh, an idea in your head like this. You know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And that's a noble idea, but think about it for a second. Between the giving and the teaching, it's kind of an awkward moment. You know, imagine there's sort of two people sitting by the stream, the fish jumping out, and one turns to the other and says, did you see that? Yeah. But it's a fish. Yeah. Well, we got given one of those yesterday. Mm -hmm. Well, if only someone could teach us how to get the fish from there to here. Mm. You know, it's like a Beckett play, yeah. waiting for Bono. Um, and, uh, I mean, the, the, the tragedy of it is it turns people who are fighting malnutrition into victims. It stops people who are grappling with this problem from being able to be agents of change. Now, it's true, malnutrition is a complex problem. Uh, we have enough food in the world today to feed everyone well. The problem of malnutrition is one of distribution. It's a problem of ecology, a problem of economics, of poverty, of power. There is no magic bullet with which we can feed the world. But there is a technology that can help. Um, it's a technology that uh, has already taken a huge chunk out of malnutrition. Uh, it has some side effects, but those are usually a sign that it's working. And it's helped people that I know uh, and their families. But people like Anita Chitaya. Um, I met Anita several years ago when I was doing some work in northern Malawi uh, on something called the Soils, Food, and Healthy Communities Project. Um, uh, Anita is uh, a mother, a primary school teacher, a volunteer, a community leader. She's a farmer, she's a scientist, she's a technologist, she kicks ass. Uh, I, I wish she were here, um, but I'm going to try and do justice to her story. And for our purposes, her story begins in the year 2000. And Malawi, in the year 2000, was in the teeth of the AIDS epidemic. Life expectancy was 46 years old. Um, the HIV AIDS prevalence was 14%, stunting that privation of nutrients in the first thousand days of life that permanently breaks children's bodies, while stunting rates were at 55%. And people were living on less than 50 cents a day. And in the year 2000, uh, Anita's firstborn child was malnourished. And so she went to the neonatal rehabilitation unit at her local clinic. Uh, and there, she was one of over 300 admissions that year, and she met Esther Lupafia. Esther was the nurse in that clinic. And she, Esther knew why there were so many kids coming in. It's because the only thing that people were eating was corn, Malawi's staple crop. And Esther knew that if people were eating a more diversified diet, uh, malnutrition could be combated. But who was going to help? The private sector had no interest in feed, you know, diversity for poor people. Uh, the government uh, was heavily in debt to countries like ours. And so they slashed their agricultural funding for uh, dietary diversity and education. Luckily, an ally, Rachel Besner Kerr, um, was able to find some money and worked with Esther on a scheme they called Farmer Research Teams. Uh, so it was about 187 farmers uh, began to experiment. They bought some seed, uh, and they began to experiment with crop rotation, you know, growing different crops in different bits of land at different times of year, to be able to do things like increase the diversity of crops, increase the level of nutrition, reduce the load of pests and weeds, uh, and supercharge the soil, increase soil fertility. And so women uh, like Anita all of a sudden start becoming scientists. And they experiment with soybeans and cow pea and pigeon pea, these amazing legumes that take the sun's light and transform it into uh, nitrogen in the soil and provide this, this protein that's great for, for people and for livestock. And all of a sudden, over the course of the years, the farmer research, research teams grow to over 3,000 people. 
and um, they grow as much corn as before, and 70% more protein. And some people even go further. Um, they've added squash to the mix. It's squash, you can see here, has these big leaves that shade out the weeds. And then you mix squash with beans, with corn, and this amazing Mesoamerican agroecological system that, that is absolutely terrific. But there was a problem. Um, the farmer research teams looked at their projections, and they saw there would be more food, and they were worried that malnutrition would go up. Wait, you have more food, better food, and malnutrition goes up? How does that happen? Because harvesting is women's work. Here's Anita at the harvest. And the thing is, she wants to harvest, because if you harvest, you control the sale of the crop, and you control household income. Uh, so you want to be in charge of the harvest, but there are other things that are women's work too, like cooking and cleaning and fetching firewood and breastfeeding. And if there's more harvesting to do, then the breastfeeding and the cooking nutritious, uh, nutritious meals can go down and malnutrition can, can rise. And so the farmer research teams realized they needed a new technology, a technology not to grow more food, but to get men to cook. How do you do that? Well, initially, they were like, okay, fine, we're going to teach men to cook. And so they, uh, they bring a nutritionist along, and they go door to door. Uh, and they say, man of the house, come out here. You may have seen your wife hunched over this. This is a pot. Uh, and then the man is like, well, I've, I've often wondered how this works. Well, it will come over here, and, and all of a sudden, it's a sort of cooking uh, experience. It's lovely, it's joyful, and the you know, nutritionist goes off into the sunset. Bye-bye. Um, and nothing changes. But of course, I mean, you wouldn't expect it to. Expect it to. It's, it's like the Food Network. You, know, you watch the Food Network for fun. You, you don't watch the Food Network expecting household gender dynamics to change. Um, so, so then they, the, 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 the farmer nutritionist said, well, okay, fine. Um, we're going to do this better. That was fun, and fun is good, uh, but we need something more. And so they came up with this sort of two-part process that looks like this. These are recipe days where a hundred Men, women, and children get together, and uh, they have a cooking contest. In Silicon Valley, this would be called gamification. But much more, much more than the game is the process of playing. Uh, because in order to play, everyone has to teach each other. You have a process of women teaching men, and men teaching other men how to do things that are women's work. And all of a sudden, uh, this space becomes a space of equality, and it becomes a space where truth can be told where women get to call men out on our patriarchy, on the way that men have written the rules of society to privilege us the world over. And then after the recipe days, there's hard door-to-door -door organizing, uh, where men's commitment to cook is put to the fire, and there's the work of women's empowerment. And so the technology that they came up with in northern Malawi to, f to solve malnutrition is this organize for gender equality. Gender is the term that Anita and her colleagues use, and they're serious about it. They've managed to get women's micro-enterprises, they've managed to get uh, collective grain storage, they've militated for better health, but the main thing has been the results. Look, in Malawi in general, child malnutrition rates for children under five have, have declined barely, uh, from uh, over 55% you know, in the year 2000 to over 40% now. But of the data that I can show you, in northern Malawi, uh, where uh, Anita has been doing her work, perhaps this is the most important. These are the admissions to the neonatal rehabilitation unit, where Anita's firstborn was admitted in the year 2000. And in 2013, the number of admissions is 11. And this is corroborated by other data. But what's important is that this has been done for $8 per person per year. And it's been done through a recognition that you don't give a man a fish. You don't teach a man to fish. Uh, if you're going to teach a man anything, you have to teach him how to cook. But to do that, you have to challenge power. You have to confront patriarchy. You have to reinvent what it means to be a man. And that's hard work. You can see why patriarchs the world over would just prefer to give the fish uh, or to give the seed. But the thing is, this matters the world over. This isn't just about Malawi. Uh, we know globally that stunting increases with gender inequality. We know that stunting decreases when girls go to secondary school. 
Uh, and we know that this has worked in, in parts of the world like South Asia. I mean, in South Asia, the drivers for reducing child malnutrition over the past 40 years, well, I mean, the, it, the, the, the smallest driver of uh, re the reduction of malnutrition in South Asia has been food. Um, dietary energy supply has contributed just 4% of the reduction of, uh, uh, of malnutrition in South Asia. Much more important have been things like uh, diversified diet, uh, access to water and sanitation, women's empowerment, which is sort of the, the gender life expectancy ratio there, and sending girls to secondary school. But that doesn't happen by magic. It takes organizing, organizing for gender equality. Some people call organizing for gender equality a social technology, a way of reordering society for, uh, for, for change. But to do that, you need to ask who's in power, who's in control of the technology. And that's why this kind of feminist technology is one of the most powerful things we have in economics, in uh, nutrition, and in international development. And perhaps even more important than the technology is how it came about. It came about driven by men and women like Anita. Driven by people who recognized that uh, everyone, regardless of race, of gender or of income can be a technologist. Everyone has a capacity for science. Everyone can govern well. And if we recognize that, then who knows what will come out of the next pharma research group. But I'll bet this, it'll be something that can end malnutrition and can help the world feed itself. Thank you.